All right, chemistry, let's take a look at our video lecture for chapter 6, section 3, and what we are hoping you get out of this section. I want you to be able to differentiate between a formula unit and a molecular formula. And I know that might seem fairly convoluted, but we simply use one word to distinguish an ionic compound and one term to, d um, to denote a covalently bonded compound. That's it. Right? If, the, if the bond involved in a particular compound is ionic, we call it a formula unit. If the bond involved in a particular compound is covalent, we call that a molecular formula. So you got that one off the table already. Then describe the arrangement of ions in crystal form. Okay, crystal form. There's a special word that goes along with that crystal form. It's called a lattice structure. Then I want you to be able to uh, describe the ionic bonding process, define lattice energy and describe its significance, and then distinguish between the characteristics like melting point, boiling point, and electrical conductivity, electrical conductivity of ionic and molecular compounds. Now, let's look at where we are in terms of this chapter as a whole. In section one, we introduce the idea of bonding, what a chemical bond is. Then in section two, we highlighted, uh, we went into a little bit more depth, covalent bonds and what it means to be a covalent bond, how they satisfy the octet rule and uh, different exceptions to that octet rule. Uh, we also drew Lewis structures as well as uh, electron dot notation. Now we're going to move from covalent bonds into ionic bonds as well as ionic compounds. So whenever we talk about ionic bonds or ionic compounds, uh, we, we have to start with ions, so we have to go through ionization. And ionization is when an atom of a non-metal takes one or more electrons from an atom of a metal, so both atoms end up with eight valence electrons. Remember, that's going to be the driving force behind everything right now, or actually everything. It's the pluses and minuses. We want to attain a noble gas electron configuration. We want to satisfy our octet rule. We want stability. Nature favors low energy configurations. And having eight valence electrons, two in the S sublevel and six in the P, uh, P sublevel, that is a stable low energy configuration. So nature wants that. Now, an ionic compound is a compound that is composed of positive and negative ions. And they are combined so that the numbers of positive and negative ions equal each other in charge. It doesn't mean the number of uh, negative ions and the number of positive ions are the same. It means the overall charges have to be equal. And they always have to be balanced in terms of their charge. We'll go over that uh, again uh, here very shortly. So ionic compound. Is this an ionic compound? Well, we see a metal, magnesium. We see a non-metal in nitrogen. Okay, so we have a metal and a non-metal. That makes sense. When these ionize, the magnesium is going to be a positive charge. The nitrogen is going to be a uh, negative charge. Okay, so that makes sense. We have oppositely charged ions. This should be an ionic compound. Not yet. Remember that last little bit I said about the charges having to be equal. They have to balance each other out. If you look at magnesium, it's in main group two, so it's got two valence electrons. So when it ionizes, it's going to form a plus two charge. Nitrogen, being in main group five, has five valence electrons, meaning when it ionizes, it's going to form a minus three charge. Those charges do not balance one another. Now, we can't change what the charges are going to be. That's impossible. We can't change what these atoms are. Yeah, that's not possible, <coughs> at least for our chemical means. What we can do is we can change how many of each ion are present. So if I were to add what are called subscripts into this formula here, so I have three magnesiums and two nitrogens, all of a sudden when I, have, when I uh, go to count the charges, I don't just have plus two from magnesium or minus three some from nitrogen, I have three plus twos. So that's a total of plus six. When I go to count my nitrogens, it's not just a total of minus three, it's two minus three. So that's a total of minus six. So now I have overall a plus six on the right side and a minus six on the right side. Those balance out. So MgN is not an ionic compound. It doesn't exist. 
but Mg3 in 2 is an ionic compound that exists. So here's my sweet, sweet animation that I did not make. I stole from someone else. So over here on the left, we see that we have the we have a non-metal, and on the right, we have a metal. So as they both come into frame, they both have electron clouds. They both have valence electrons. But remember, a metal is going to donate its valence electrons. It's going to ionize to form a positively charged ion, right? Reverting back to the uh, most recent noble gas electron configuration. While the non-metal is going to take on those electrons to move forward to the next noble gas um, in the periodic table, both achieving a noble gas electron configuration, but at the end of this process, after the end of the transfer, they will now have opposite charges and therefore attract, electrostatic attra attraction. It all comes back to pluses and minuses. So we keep on throwing around this word ion. Let's make sure that we understand exactly what an ion is supposed to mean. An ion is any atom, any atom, or even a group of atoms, with more or less electrons than it's supposed to have. Remember that the number of electrons is supposed to be equal to the number of protons if the atom has a neutral charge. And so when we look at the periodic table, we see atoms with neutral charges. And so that's why early in the year, we assume that whatever the atomic number was, whatever the number of protons was, that is how many electrons uh, that particular atom also had. Now that's true if the atom is neutral, but since then, we've added on to this idea that atoms want to gain a uh, noble gas electron configuration. So that will involve them either losing or gaining electrons to achieve that goal. So some atoms will have more electrons than they're supposed to have. right? Therefore, they will be negatively charged. They will be anions. Those are typically the nonmetals. Or some, some uh, will have fewer electrons. charge cations those are typically the cations so that uh, normal sodium okay a normal sodium atom it, it's number 11 on the periodic table so it's gonna have 11 protons that means if it's normal if it's neutral it's got 11 electrons as well well it wants to have 10 electrons so that it has the electron uh, configuration of neon so it's gonna lose one electron so as a result we have a sodium ion, which is still sodium because it's got 11 protons. Remember, the number of protons, the atomic number, defines the identity of the atom. But it's got fewer electrons than it's supposed to have. So we consider that a sodium ion. Nonmetals do the opposite. They will tend to gain electrons, and they will become negatively charged anions. So let's look at the, the normal chlorine atom. It's number 17, uh, so 17 protons. Normal chlorine will also have 17 or should I say neutral chlor uh, chlorine will also have 17 electrons. It's going to gain one. Okay, it's going to gain one so that it can uh, attain the noble gas electron configuration of argon. Once it does that, it's still going to be chlorine, so it still has 17 protons, but it's going to gain, it's going to have 18 electrons and be a chloride ion. Now, let's look at how we name these things. Sodium plus one, we call it the sodium ion, right? That's a, and it doesn't matter. It does not matter if you write plus one or one plus. I go back and forth. I can't remember. I can't make up my mind. I don't even think about it. But when you go, it's a subscript, it's a subscript, superscript. N a plus one or N a one plus doesn't matter. We call that sodium ion. The plus one means that it's lost one electron. Mg two plus is still called the magnesium ion. The plus two means that it's lost two electrons. Naming positively charged cations is pretty simple. But when we go on to the negatively charged anions, uh, we actually have a little bit of a naming rule, a little, your, first, your first glimpse of nomenclature. So sulfur, when it ionizes, it's going to gain two electrons, so it's going to have a negative two charge, but we don't call it the sulfur ion. We call it a sulfur ion. So what we're doing here is we're taking the last syllable, right, the er in sulfur. We're taking the last syllable, getting rid of it, we're dropping it, and we're adding IDE. So sulfide. Sulfur becomes sulfide when it ionizes. Chlorine plus, or sorry, chlorine minus one is going to, it's gained one electron, right, so it's got a negative one charge. 
It goes from chlorine. We're going to drop that ene, the I-N-E. We're going to replace it with I-D-E, so it becomes chloride. Right? So the positively charged cations, you don't change the name. The negatively charged anions, you drop the last syllable and you add an I-D-E. We also have polyatomic ions. Uh, they're groups of atoms that act like one ion. So in, like within themselves, okay, within the polyatomic ion, they are covalently bonded. But as a group, as a whole, uh, there are either more or less electrons uh, than there ought to be. And so it becomes an ion. For example, a common, uh, some common ones that uh, we work with, the ammonium ion, <coughs> right? NH4, right? Normally it should be like NH3 to be uh, neutrally charged, or sorry, neutral. But if it's got NH4, you've added one proton to the mix, right? An extra, an extra hydrogen, but not the electron that comes with it. And so you have a plus one charge. You have the carbonate ion, okay? CO3, it's got a minus two charge. And you have the phosphate ion. And so we do have polyatomic ions. Uh, you do not need to memorize these. You do want to recognize them as polyatomic ions, but you don't need to memorize them because guess what's on the opposite side of your periodic table? A polyatomic ion sheet. So you get to look them up all the time. Now, polyatomic ions, they act just like any other negatively charged ion or positively charged ion when they're bonding. You, so you treat them like an ion. They're, you treat them as a unit. So we know that sodium is going to form a plus one charge. If you flip over your periodic table, look at your polyatomic ion sheet like you ought to, you'll see that SO4 is called sulfate, and it has a minus two charge. Well, here's the trick. If I want to make sure that this is a proper ionic compound, the, balances, the, sorry, the charges need to balance. Well, I have a plus one and a minus two. They're not balanced. So what I will do is I'll take this plus one, and I'll move it down diagonal and I'll take this minus 2 and move it down diagonal so that I end up with in a 2 SO4. Now you might wonder like where did the 1 go that I moved down to the bottom right if, it, if it's 1 is always assumed you don't have to write the 1 but the, a 2 or a 3 or a 4 is not assumed you do have to write those so this uh, ionic compound is called sodium sulfate so if we look at something like uh, aluminum uh, bonding with nitrate, again, that is a polyatomic ion. You need to look on your uh, polyatomic ion sheet You'll see uh, and, uh, to find its charge because you can't memorize these things. I mean, you could, but you don't need to. Uh, aluminum, however, is in main group three, so it forms a plus three charge. Uh, looking at your polyatomic ion sheet, uh, nitrate forms a minus one charge. And so in order for this to be a proper ionic compound, we're going to have one aluminum and three nitrates, right? That way the, ba the charge is balanced. But if I simply write Al1 NO3 3, it looks like Al1 NO33, like 33 oxygens, and that's not appropriate. So what we're going to do is we're going to put parentheses around the nitrate to indicate that it's acting as a, as a unit. And so that red 3 at the bottom of the screen indicates that there are three nitrates, and within a nitrate, there are three oxygens, right? So that's, that's one unit, one nitrogen and three oxygens form a nitrate, and there are three of those units. So three nitrogens there and nine oxygens there. I'm going to finish up by looking at uh, some properties of ionic compounds. Um, they form what are called crystalline structures, crystalline structures. And a crystalline structure is a regular repeating arrangement of ions in a solid. Okay, so we're only going to see an ionic compound as a crystal, as a, as a lattice crystal, or sorry, crystal lattice, when it's in the solid state. When it melts and becomes a liquid, no, no more crystal, because it's not a solid. When it's in a gas, no more crystal, because it's not in a solid. Ions are very strongly bonded. They are very strongly bonded. To have a, a whole positive charge and a whole negative charge electrostatically attracting each other it is, is very strong. It's the strongest type of bond uh, that... Uh, that we have in this class. Uh, because these bonds are so strong and, and, and the, the charges are repeating, everything is locked in place really, really tightly. And so the structure is very, very rigid. And because these ions are very strongly bonded together and the structure is so rigid, that means it takes a lot of energy 
to overcome those bonds and transition from the solid state into a liquid state, aka has a very high melting point, right? It, it has to be very, very hot to melt an ionic compound. So here's a representation of a crystalline. negative anions like a magnet and they re the is allowing charge it, it can be electrons it can be um, ions themselves but if anything that's charged can move we consider that to be able to conduct electricity so in a solid those ions right we have charged species but they're locked into place so they can't move so ionic solid insulators meaning they don't conduct electricity but when we melt them and they're not locked into that crystalline uh, structure that that lattice crystal crystal lattice the ions can move around and now those charged species can move around well that's what it means to conduct electricity so a melted ionic compound can conduct electricity however that's kind of tough because you need to get them uh, up to about 800 degrees Celsius which is very difficult it is a very very difficult What's easier to do, however, is to simply dissolve them in water. Take salt, like a salt cube, which is a three-dimensional lattice structure of alternating sodium and chloride ions. It would, it would take upwards of 800 degrees Celsius to melt that and allow it to conduct electricity. However, if you just put it in water, it'll dissolve. And when it's dissolved, those charges can move and it will conduct electricity. Th uh, we're going to end on this. Ionic solids are very brittle. And we're going to use this to contrast metallic bonding in the next section. Okay, so we're, we're going to highlight this right now so we can look at its opposite later. Ionic solids are very, very brittle so, because there is going to be strong repulsion. Any, sort of any, so, any sort of repulsion is going to break the crystal apart. Now notice right next to any of these charges is the opposite charge. So it's very uh, strongly attracted. You might say, what about diagonal? Well, they're a lot further away than the left and right and up and down. So there's a lot of attraction going on here. But if we were to shift right, this row of ions over to the right one, notice that they would line up positive to positive, negative to negative, positive to positive, negative to negative. And instead of having attraction, there would instantaneously be a strong repulsion. And that entire chunk of the solid would launch off. It would break off very easily. And this is why ionic solids are brittle. Once you reach a certain point, they will snap apart. They'll snap apart because at that point, you've, you've moved the crystal enough that positives and negative charges uh, line up with the like charge, positives and positives and negatives and negatives, which most of chemistry comes down to. All right, chemistry, I will see you next period.